Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Earth Talk this evening. Um, we're in for a fascinating discussion, I'm sure. We're going to run for about an hour and 45 minutes, and there will be time for comments and questions. Um, so without further ado, I'll hand over to our host this evening, Colin Paulson. I'd just like to say it's lovely to see so many people here. It's a really a topic I'm very passionate about, and it's really lovely to see so many people come to share in that. Um, so food for me, food, I love food growing because it's something that brings people together. I've been working in the last 20 years and what with growing the food, harvesting the food or cooking together or eating it together, it's a really good way of bringing people together and making community. And we have a lot of that around here, but food can also be quite a divisive issue. There's so many issues around it. Should we be vegan? Should we be vegetarian? Should we buy organic? Should we buy fair trade? Should we buy local? Should we buy things that are in season? And it can be quite difficult to know where to go with all those things. And there's so many issues that are very much related to food. And in some ways, it's one of the most important things we can do, where we buy our food and where we source it from. There's things like climate change and soil loss and biodiversity loss and so on. And all those things feed into food and, and how we produce it. And I personally have been uh, reading and following these two for many years in, in The Guardian and, and The Lamb magazine and, and also the, the debates they've had between them. For many years, I was just talking to George beforehand, and uh, they, you both met each other at the, the road protest days and, 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 and through things like Tinker's Bubble and so on. So it's, I think it's a great opportunity to actually see them in the flesh and, and uh, hear what they've got to say together. Um, so we have two very, like I say, very knowledgeable speakers that will help, hopefully help us to navigate these quite complex issues. We have George Monbio, who's an author, Guardian columnist and environmental activist. His best-selling novels include Feral, Rewilding the Land, Sea and Human Life, Heat, How to Stop the Planet Burning, and Out of the Wreckage, A New Politics for an Age of Crisis. George also co-wrote the concept album Breaking the Spell of Loneliness with musician Ewan McKellen. His viral videos include How Wolves Change Rivers, viewed by over 40 million YouTube viewers, and Nature Now, co-presented with Greta Thunberg, has over 60 million views. His latest book, Regenesis, Feeding the World Without Devouring the Planet, was published in May 2022. And actually, that's for sale at the back. You can buy a copy at the end if you like. Simon Fairley has worked for 20 years voraciously as an agricultural labourer, vine worker, shepherd, fisherman, builder and stonemason before being ensnared by the computer in 1990. He was a co-editor of The Ecologist magazine for four years until he joined Tinker's Bubble community in 1994, where he managed the cows, pigs and a working horse. He now runs a micro dairy at Monks and Wild Port, a charity and cooperative in rural Dorset. He's a family member of the Land magazine, well worth reading if you haven't seen a copy. And he now makes his living selling size. He's author of The Low Impact Development, Planning and People in a Sustainable Countryside and Meet a Benign Extravagance. And as his memoir, the latest to be published, Going to Seed, is also for sale tonight. And I think some you're gonna be signing copies of those at the end if people would like a signed copy. <laughs> so um, I'm going to stop talking now because it's what it's these two you've come to listen to. Um, we've got a quite I'm going to be quite strict on timing. So Simon's going to start with 20 minutes, and and then George will follow up with another 20 minutes afterwards, and then they'll both have 10 minutes each, and then we'll have about half an hour at the end for questions and comments. And I should also say um, hello and welcome to everyone joining us online as well. Great to have you here. Okay, Simon, would you like to make a start? Uh, okay. Uh, yes, I, I've known, as I said, I've known George for 25, 30 years or so. Um, and in fact, if you look at the photo on the cover of uh, my book there, you'll see that I'm standing there with a horse. But you also see a pair of legs on that photo. Uh, well, these are the legs. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And and um, in fact, what George is doing is is, is um, managing the plow behind the horse at Tinker's Bubble. Um, uh, something that perhaps he might not want to do so readily now. In fact, I might even find him standing in front of me saying, "Farmer, save that soil." But uh, nonetheless, uh, so in some ways, our paths have diverged on one particular issue. Uh, there are plenty of things I agree with George about. He writes magnificently about certain things. Um, <clears throat> most recently about the public order bills that 
the pretty Bravello or whatever name is bringing through. And, um, uh, but our paths have diverged and we've been debating the issue we're debating the, tonight for some years now. Uh, I no longer have a horse either. Um, and the reason being, that, rather sadly, the reason being that, uh, that the farm I work on is, is, is rather small now. It's eight and a half acres. Uh, it has two Jersey cows, two pigs, maybe three, uh, and about an acre of uh, garden and arable. Uh, and <clears throat> it functions really quite well. Uh, and it, it, and I bring it, I talk about it here because it is, well, first of all, it is basically a miniature organic mixed farm of the, a miniature version of the kind of farm that was actually very common, maybe 50, 60, 70 years ago, but has been <clears throat> progressively put out of business by specialized dairy farms and specialized grain farms. It's also interesting because it's a microcosm uh, uh, in a way of society because it serves a community, the community where I live. The way it works uh, is basically the fount of the fertility that runs like a stream through the whole uh, process is grass. Um, we have eight and a half acres, one acre is arable, seven and a half are, are grass. They're great, it's either grade four or grade three B land, so it's hilly land, most of it's not arable, a little bit of it is. Uh, and that grass uh, is grazed by cows or made into hay, uh, and uh, <clears throat> the cows produce uh, about 4,000 litres each, i.e. about 1,000 litres per acre. Um, but the, <clears throat> the hay is, uh, is what keeps the cows alive over winter. I spend a lot of time, well, several of us spend a lot of time making the hay uh, in order to feed the cows during the winter because they couldn't do it themselves. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, what they don't eat goes for bedding. The bedding goes for manure, which goes onto the garden uh, and uh, <clears throat> produces uh, about half the more than half the vegetables we eat. At the same time, there is also a small patch of arable, um, which is basically miniature lay farming, uh, in which uh, there's a rotation of uh, two patches of grass, and then it's potatoes, catch crop of turnips, and onions, and then back to grass. Uh, and <clears throat> that too, uh, uh, well, provides the, that provides the food for us, uh, the milk, yogurt, uh, butter, cheese, and so forth. Uh, we're pretty, more or less self-sufficient in, in all of that, thanks to the two cows. Uh, the, um, we also keep two pigs, and the role of the pigs is really to mop up waste. They basically don't have a feed bill. Uh, very, in winter, they kind of top up, but mostly they eat whey, uh, and they eat the food waste uh, that comes out of the uh, kitchen. Uh, I'm not supposed to say that because it's illegal, but... Uh, uh, we'll see what happens. Nothing ever happened. No, they'll put another movement order on me, probably. Um, but, uh, uh, and where are we? Uh, it, um, oh, yes, and the, the, <clears throat> where the pigs are, uh, they also rotate between two patches of land. So we have potatoes. So we're using the fertility from the pigs to grow more potatoes. Um, and uh, what else? Well, the other waste that occurs is the human waste, uh, which then goes back into a wet system, a sort of rebed system, uh, where it feeds uh, an orchard and also some glyceria grass, which the cows eat. So you've got a whole circular system. It's not perfect. It doesn't, it doesn't grow grain because we just don't have enough land for it, but it is, uh, a system that very much is a micro is a miniature version of a mixed organic farm. Now there are uh, 
four lessons that I want to bring out from that, from using that as an example um, in, in the next few minutes. Um, the first one is that the system is actually, so given that it's grade four, very grade four land, um, mostly, uh, it's actually surprisingly productive. It produces uh, a thousand liters of milk per acre in a normal year. When it's a dry year, it's not quite as good as that. Um, now in George's book, uh, there are a number of figures that I, I don't feel terribly happy with. And one of them uh, on page 78, I think it, it is, he, he says, that uh, dairy, uh, it takes dairy, uh, producing milk takes 27 meters, square meters of land to produce 100 grams of protein uh, compared to tofu, which, uh, which, which uses just two square meters. Uh, well, I, I thought, well, how many do we use? Um, I calculated it. And with a thousand thousand liters an acre, it comes to uh, ten square meters, which is you know a good deal less than twenty seven square meters. Uh, I then looked at other systems. A the, the, uh, the system proposed by um, the Sustainable Food Trust in their uh, their document feeding the ground up four square meters. That it seems to be standard for uh, an organic farm using lay, uh, lay uh, you know, basically temporary grass uh, that's part of the fertility building system of a, a mixed organic farm. If you go to intensive uh, farm, farms uh, in Ireland, uh, it comes to two square meters uh, per 100 grams of protein for the milk produced in Ireland, which is the same as tofu. So I don't know where they, I, I, I did inquire of uh, our world in data where they got this figure from of 27 square meters. Uh, um, it comes, I think, from Poor and Nemechek, which is the sort of fount of vegan statistics, really. Um, and <clears throat> it's, it's a paper in science. <laughs> Uh, it's a paper in science, but it, and, and unless they spend an awful lot of time looking at the performance of goats in Burkina Faso, I really have no idea how they got this figure of 27 square meters, which is simply inapplicable to anywhere that has grass growing in a reasonable abundance. Any, uh, certainly any temperate country, certainly Europe. Um, it's uh, this. <clears throat> A thousand liters an acre, well, a thousand liters is enough, provides enough protein and fat, and fat is just as important as, uh, in some ways, just as important as protein, uh, uh, to feed two people, right? Um, uh, so uh, an acre is, it, it, uh, of this rough grassland is, feed, is providing protein and fat for two people. There are 15 million of these acres in, in Britain. That's the, the protein and fat for 30 million people. And that's just off rough land that you cannot, uh, well, most of which you, you, uh, you cannot grow crops on. On the land that you cannot grow crops on, <coughs> you can uh, produce twice as much protein per acre. It, it is entirely feasible. I'm not saying we, it, all the land that's right, that should be put over it. But if it were put over to it, we could quite easily uh, produce all the protein and all the fat and about half the, half the calories uh, for everybody in England. Uh, I'll leave it there. The second lesson uh, I, I want to draw from this is about the use of food waste. As I said, our pigs, uh, consume, uh, live almost entirely, except in a, right in the middle of winter, uh, off uh, the food waste coming up that we, we consume, garden waste, uh, and uh, the whey from the milk. Uh, they, uh, we get about 250 uh, kilos of pork, well, at least 250, but a quarter of a ton of pork uh, per year 
more or less free of charge. And this is actually, again, echoes what happens in society. Because although we hear a lot about the amount of space that animals take uh, <clears throat> and the amount of grain they consume, one quarter of all the feed that is fed to animals, this is a, a paper by Anne Motet of the FAO, uh, one quarter of all the feed that is fed to animals is uh, either uh, crop residues or uh, um, some kind of uh, 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 process, uh, food processing waste. That's not even counting the, the domestic food waste. Uh, Where am I? <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. Uh, the Hannah Van Zanten is another paper on this, and she's calculated that with a vegan diet, if uh, you take all the food processing waste and a proportion of the food waste from a vegan diet, of one person, one adult, that produces, and um, feed it to livestock, that will produce enough protein to, uh, uh, for, to provide one person with a quarter of their uh, entire protein needs, uh, which again, it echoes the, 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 the other statistics. Uh, about a quarter of protein and a quarter of, of livestock <coughs> feed uh, provides a quarter of, um, I'm getting very unarticulate here, I'm getting muddled up with my quarters, because <clears throat> you, you can probably now guess what proportion of the British potato crop is uh, regarded as a substandard and fed to livestock. It is, of course, a quarter. The uh, I bring this up basically because it's well up until recently it was hardly talked about at all, but it is ignored. It's ignored in George's book. Um, it's ignored by a great many of the uh, advocates of veganism. Really, that a large amount of of, of food waste and uh, non-competing food uh, stuff that we can't eat. It's absorbed by animals. If it's not given to animals, it goes out of the food chain and it can becomes a problem at the moment. The, <clears throat> the food you know, to, the councils to get rid of their food waste are having to pay uh, <clears throat> anaerobic digestion plants to get rid of it. Uh, where are we? How much have got left? Uh, global warming is the third lesson I want to take from. Uh, from our little farm. Uh, the FAO says, states that uh, livestock are responsible for 14.5% of uh, greenhouse gas emissions, um, which may or may not be true. It's contested, uh, but let's assume that it is true. Of that 14.5%, uh, a, fa a fairly large proportion is caused by a fairly small proportion of the livestock. Um, uh, and I have to say that not much of it is caused by the sort of farming that we do at Monkton Wild. Uh, for example, uh, <clears throat> uh, quite a lot of the 14.5% uh, comes from deforestation, mostly in Brazil. Uh, for soya and for beef. Well, that's not us. The uh, a fair amount comes from the uh, fossil fuels used to make fertilizer. Well, that's not us. We're organic. Uh, uh, some of it comes in the form of nitrous oxide. Um, yes, we will be emitting some nitrous oxide because uh, all farmers do. Um, 
but we're not emitting it, uh, to, and it to, to, we're not creating great slurry lagoons that uh, leak methane and nitrous oxide. Uh, we're composting it. Uh, three minutes, Simon. How much? Oh, five minutes. Oh, three, dear. three minutes. Three minutes. Oh, gosh. Um, uh, um, well, we don't have any packaging material. Uh, our transport is low and our methane is, um, uh, we'll come to methane later. <laughs> uh, okay, um, the, 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 the other bit that I really want to emphasize is well, <clears throat> when uh, George and other people talk about 51% uh, of, uh, of um, uh, the UK is occupied by livestock, you get the impression that there's, it's just, well, you know, every acre has a cow on it. But a, wherever there's a cow, it's share, grazing, it's sharing that land with a whole host of other, uh, what you could call them commensals, because they're partaking of the table uh, that humans offer them. So on our land, we have, uh, we've got uh, about 50 plants in the, in, in the meadows, and we've got knapweed, bugles, we've got ragged robin, uh, we've got the same again in the hedgerows, there's more in the woodlands that surround it. That the grasshoppers, there's uh, <coughs> uh, dung beetles, there's all sorts of insects, there's uh, at least a dozen sort of butterflies, uh, there's voles and moles and badgers and rabbits and deer and go on. There's hundreds and hundreds of species sharing the land with uh, our two cows. <laughs> and they are all part of an ecosystem which has co evolved over. Uh, 12,000 years, and which functions brilliantly. It, uh, I get up in the morning, I go, I feel a bit grotty first thing, I go out and I look uh, at the grass, and I look at the cows waiting to be fed, or and the, the, the swallows flying around, and, and, and I think to myself, what a wonderful world. <laughs> it's how anybody who wants to abolish this is, in my mind, completely bonkers. I'm not, I, I'm not saying it has to uh, occupy all the land everywhere. It would be great, and I, I completely agree with George here, it would be great to find some more space for wildlife as well. It, almost everybody agrees that, and it can be done. Um, the One minute. One minute. Oh, I've got to find the, where is it? Ah. Oh. oh, the bloody land magazine. That's not what I'm looking for. <laughs> um, here, this Feeding Britain from the ground up uh, uh, by Sustainable Food Trust uh, describes how Britain uh, can feed itself uh, to the same degree as it can at the moment, uh, can, uh, but providing an extra two and a half million hectare, that's an extra 10% of the entire land mass uh, as either woodland or rewilding through farms that are basically the same as our little one. Bigger ones, but uh, that basically mixed farms doing dairy, in particular dairy and beef, and where the fertility comes from the grass and uh, there are no poisons, no pesticides, no uh, artificial fertilizers, because we're gonna run out anyway, the way things are going. Um, the idea of uh, of getting rid of all the animals from this system, it doesn't make sense. It's it's going to be basically throwing up. I mean, we all want to see an end to uh, factory farms and to specialist dairy farms with their great slurry lagoons and so forth. <coughs> uh, but by going, you by, by proposing veganism, you're basically throwing the baby out with the bathwater because uh, you're you're losing 12,000 years of uh, symbiotic co-evolution between humans and animals and all the other plants and, and, and birds and, and mammals and so forth that share a, 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 a mixed farming grassland environment, which is what England does best. Thank you, Simon.
you want next, George? Thank you. Um, thanks very much, Simon. And uh, Simon, as, as we say, we go a long way back and we are dear friends, which is just as well. <laughs> um, now, uh, there are two primary threats to life on Earth, and one of them is very familiar, and the other one is surprising to a degree that constantly surprises me. In other words, they should be equally familiar to us. The first is fossil fuels, and we all know, I hope, what fossil fuels are doing to life on Earth, and the other one is livestock. And this is the issue which has just, well, it's been the Cinderella issue for environmentalism for far too long. It's the issue which people don't want to talk about. It's almost as if we've created a moral force field around it to preserve it from criticism. But the figures are really stark. Livestock farming is the primary agent of deforestation worldwide. It's the primary agent of habitat destruction, of wildlife loss, of species extinction. It's a major cause of soil erosion, of water use. Um, it produces more greenhouse gases than the entire global transport sector, primarily in the form of methane and nitrous oxide, neither of which are process emissions, are both direct emissions from the livestock and their dung. Um, it is, in many countries, the foremost cause of water pollution and a major cause of air pollution. And it is by far and away the biggest cause of land use. Now, land use has been grossly neglected by environmentalists. It should be one of our top concerns because every hectare of land we use for our own purposes is a hectare that cannot be occupied by wild ecosystems such as rainforests, for instance, or savannas, or wetlands, or mangrove forests. Um, there's, and the great majority of species on Earth require wild ecosystems with no significant human intervention for their survival. Now, we often hear Simon and others saying that, you know, as he's more or less said just now, that the systems they run mimic wild systems and have a wide range of species and you know by comparison to say arable crops they can do though often um pastures of uh, as particularly when we're looking at reseeded perennial ryegrass pastures are actually even poorer in other species than um than, 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 than arable fields are um, but they are missing huge tranches of the food chain the most obvious one is large predators. And the reason why large predators have been driven to extinction in many parts of the world, including the UK, is the livestock industry. Even the greenest, most um, earthy livestock farmers absolutely hate wolves and cougars and coyotes and lions and all the other species which might eat their livestock. And the reason we don't have wolves and lynx in this country is that they were eliminated by livestock farmers or on behalf of livestock farmers. The reason we can't bring them back is the opposition of livestock farmers. We can't even bring back golden eagles to England. We can't even bring back white-tailed eagles because livestock farmers again and again block that. We often talk about wildlife um, human in interactions, you know, the, um, the, the, the problems between wildlife and humans, but in almost all cases, there are actually problems between wildlife and livestock farming. Livestock farming creates, well, a completely different situation to the one that pertains in nature, a situation with fences, where wild herbivores tend to be fenced out, a situation which might be rich in certain guilds, functional groups, particularly detritivores, which eat dung, um, certain wild flowers, but is extremely poor in all the other functional groups that make up a thriving ecosystem. And the real problem we face now is as a result of something called Bennett's Law, which is that as people become richer, they eat a more protein and fat rich diet. And that primarily means more animal products. And this is about the hardest law of human existence. I mean, even in India with massive prohibitions, um, uh, with very strong religious taboos where vigilante action actually murders people for eating meat. We're seeing a significant rise in meat eating, in fact, animal products altogether, 
are rising by 4% a year, their consumption. That means a doubling every 18 years. Now, people go on about the population crisis and what they mean is the human population, but the human population is rising by 1% a year. In fact, it's about the only environmental indicator which is heading towards a plateau. The global livestock population is rising by 2.4% a year. Already we have a situation where only 4% of the world's mammals by weight are wild ones. 60% of mammals are livestock, 36% are human beings. Only 4% are wild. With birds, only 29% are wild and all the rest are poultry, almost all of them chickens. And this is destined only to become worse and worse unless we intervene in this greatest potentially of all threats to life on earth. Unless we do something to break the relationship between increasing wealth and the increasing consumption of animal products. Um, uh, by 2050, on current trends, to put this in crude terms, there'll be 100 million tonnes of extra human being and 400 million tonnes of extra livestock. So what are we going to see? 2% of the world's mammals being wild, 1% of the world's mammals being wild. We are pushing outwards and outwards and outwards and destroying the capacity of ecosystems to survive. This is a full spectrum assault on the living world is the assault from livestock. Now, Simon gave a delightful, beautiful presentation, but it's a perfect exemplar of the dangers of extrapolation. Again and again in science, you hear this phrase, the plural of anecdote is not data. And what we have is a vast body of data, a huge amount of scientific work conducted in this country, conducted around the world, showing, showing the figures for land use in particular, but also figures for water use, figures for greenhouse gases and the rest of it. You cannot extrapolate from one small farm and look at the global food system through that lens, not least because the great majority of people in this country and indeed the majority of people worldwide live in cities. Now we've got, we've I think almost fetishized the idea of local food production and, and food miles. And food miles is often seen as the most important of all environmental issues to do with food. But actually it's a very small component, if we look at greenhouse gases, of the total greenhouse gas content of your food. By far the biggest component is not where it comes from, but what it is. So um, again, using global data sets and these are global averages, you would have to ship a kilo of dried beans 100 times around the planet to reach the greenhouse gas impact of a kilo of beef from the farm right next door to you. We've grossly overemphasized this issue of where it comes from. We've underemphasized the issue of what it is. And the problem here, uh, part of the problem, is, is that because we tend to live in dense settlements, such as cities, the great majority of us do not have a sufficient agricultural hinterland to feed us. And there was um, a paper in, I believe, Nature Food, where they looked at the minimum distance over which the world's people could be fed. And on average, um, uh, uh, the, the minimum distance to feed us on grain is 2,200 kilometers. And that's because where we live is not where the big food producing regions are. We are highly dependent on the Canadian prairies, the US Midwest, the interior of Brazil, the Ukrainian Chernozem, the, the, the Russian steppes for much of our grain as we've, we've discovered with, with Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Um, and, and there are some elements of that that we can repatriate, but the fundamental relationship still holds. So you can't say, right, so, you know, we're just going to cycle our food waste around in, in this farm. By the time we've wasted some food in the cities, the post-consumer waste, it's totally mixed up with all sorts of other stuff and becomes extremely expensive and difficult to unmix. And this is why waste is always a foot in the door for destructive activities. You know, they said biogas was going to run off waste. Instead, from the outset, they start growing maize to feed the biogas digesters. They, they said that uh, biodiesel was going to be from waste chip fat, well, almost all of it is coming from palm oil. 
Yeah, and when people say, oh, we could feed all the animals on waste, well, then you ask, well, why aren't we doing that now? It's because waste is expensive to handle, it's inconsistent, is often lower in energy than, than dedicated crops. So if we say we could feed all the animals on waste, you could potentially, but then there'll be interruptions in supply, there'll be inconsistencies, it'll be more expensive than the dedicated crops. And what will we see? We'll see farmers going for the easier and cheaper option, which is to feed animals on dedicated crops instead. And so, so the, the idea of sort of trying to build your global picture from an eight acre farm, it simply does not hold. You can't do that. You cannot extrapolate and get meaningful results from that. Um, and Simon talks about issues like co-evolution. You know, it's not co-evolution. Some species have managed to survive alongside our massive onslaught and the great majority have not. That's not evolution. That's just the, the um, survival of those which can. And, and you know, we're not look, talking about new species developing as a, a, as a result. And the other issue I think which I would raise is this notion that Simon creates this impression of a closed loop. You know, the nutrients go round and round and nothing is lost. And that's what we would all like to see. That's what all farming should aim at. But there is a fundamental problem and it's a problem that besets organic farming, which is that the nutrient loop is actually even more open in, on average, in organic farming than it is in conventional farming. And it's bad enough in conventional farming. Um, and, and one reason it's so bad is the over-application of fertilizer and the fact that nitrogen or NPK fertilizer um, tends to release its nutrients in a sharp spike. It's too fast. But the problem with manure is it's too slow. So you must apply it to the land before you've planted your crop and it starts leaching straight away from that point. Um, it will then provide some of the nutrients that the plant requires during the major phase of crop growth, but not sufficient to achieve um, high yields, which you might get with other systems. And then after the crop has matured and been harvested, it will continue to leach nutrients. And as a result, one paper shows you lose 37% more nitrogen from crops fed with animal manure than, than artificial fertilizer. And artificial fertilizer is bad enough. I mean, very irresponsibly applied, but you're losing a third more nitrogen through the application of manure. Um, simply because its cycle is out of sync with the crop growth cycle. And again, we say, well, but in nature it works. Well, in nature, there are very, very few circumstances where you get anything like agricultural applications of manure to the land. And, what you, and if you look at the British situation, for instance, most of our agricultural soils were woodland soils. They, they were um, occupied by perennial species such as um, trees and, and, um, and, and, and long lasting shrubs and, and the rest of it, where the cycling is much slower, they're there all the time, you don't have bare land in between, you don't have anything like the nutrient loss that you get in these systems which are supposed to imitate um, those systems in, in nature. So how, how does organic farming work under these circumstances? I was utterly puzzled by this, it was one of the, many issues over which I was scratching my head until I started digging into it. I looked at the Soil Association's organic standards and found that an organic farmer can plug those nutrient gaps by buying manure from a farmer who is not organic. Now, I find this absolutely mind-blowing because, you know, not only does that mean that you can use Harbour Bosch nitrogen, in, in artificial nitrogen, as long as it's been through someone else's animals, but then none of the organic standards are applied to that manure which you're putting on your farm. And amazingly, it says nothing about heavy metals, which is a massive issue in manure. It says nothing about antibiotic residues, which is extraordinary because, you know, here we, the Soil Association says, you know, that farmers should treat their animals homeopathically. And yet here you are applying antibiotic residues to, 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 to the land with no controls on that at all. It says nothing about um, 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 polyaromatic hydrocarbons and other 
um, organic chemicals and organic chemicals in this case are not it's not the same as organic farming these are things which um, synthetic organic chemicals we should be very wary of and and there are no controls there, there are no controls in those standards on those contaminants in the manure so there's a real problem here which we're all glossing over we're all pretending it's not there and when we pretend that problems are not there that's when we get into massive trouble now and I know this is highly controversial with, with a lot of people, but I think it's more controversial than it should be. We're on the cusp of a whole new food revolution, a food revolution, some of which doesn't require any farming whatsoever or not farming as, as we're used to. What we've done over the past 10 or 12,000 years is to work with two kingdoms, with plants and animals, with multicellular organisms. And we push them to the absolute limit and beyond in order to try to feed what is now 8 billion people. And we've been struggling all the while with the fact that we're using a basically Neolithic production system, and Simon would make it a lot more Neolithic than it is, to feed a 21st century population. And these things just do not square. So we have this enormous environmental load coupled with a real threat to global food security. Whether we were able to continue to feed ourselves is now a massive open question, not least because of the enormous damage we're doing to soil and, and indeed to many other um, essential components of a farming system. But throughout this 10 or 12,000 years, we've scarcely experimented at all with selecting and breeding microorganisms, single-celled organisms. We're talking about fundamentally the same thing. You, you take wild organisms, you breed them to be more like the kind of organisms you want. You, you, you bring them together in a place which in, in, in we might call a farm when it's multicellular organisms, or we might call a brewery when it's unicellular organisms, and you breed them to produce a product. But in this case, you can do it without any animal welfare issues, any of the cruelty involved in killing 76 billion animals a year, which we currently do. You can do it uh, with a tiny fraction of the environmental impacts on a tiny amount of the land, and you can do it almost anywhere, anywhere which has got an electricity supply from which you can make hydrogen or methanol, which can be the, the, the feedstock that the microorganisms eat. And so suddenly you can deal with two, possibly the two biggest issues of all at the same time. You can take very large areas of land out of production and return them to nature. And this might be our only chance now of getting through this century and those that follow, the mass restoration of nature. It could stop the sixth great extinction in its tracks. It could draw down vast amounts of the carbon dioxide we've already released into the atmosphere. But secondly, you can deliver food security in places which are highly food insecure at the moment. There are many nations on earth which are totally dependent on imports from thousands of miles away, which are denominated in dollars while those countries have got soft currencies. They are constantly struggle to buy that food. And as the global food system becomes less and less stable, and it, there are some very worrying signs indeed, about shocks being transmitted through this, this, this very um, long distance global food system, those countries become ever less secure. In, in their food supplies. Mm -hmm. But with, with um, um, a brewing of microorganisms, well, you can do it anyway. You don't need fertile land. You don't need lots of water. In fact, all you need really is sunlight as your energy source. And almost all the hungry countries on earth have loads of sunlight. So you've got this tremendous potential to break that import dependency and, and deliver food security far more effectively than farming does in countries which don't have sufficient um, fertile land and, and water. But we have this innate resistance because I think we are addicted to the aesthetics of farming. Even though the great majority of farming, the great majority of where all of us get our food looks nothing like the storybook image, nothing like the farming that Simon is talking about. It's, it's about as far removed as it can possibly be and we're all in denial 
about where it's really coming from. Almost all our animal products come out of factories, hideous, brutal factories. If we treated our dogs like we treat pigs, we would literally be sent to prison. And yet we've completely normalized this. But we, we, can, we can massively reduce those impacts. We can massively reduce our impacts on the planet and we can greatly enhance our food security by overcoming that aesthetic storybook notion of what farming is and what farming should be. Thank you. Thank you, George. Simon, you've got 10 minutes to respond. Okay. Oh, uh, I need 35 minutes. <laughs> uh, we, we, we can overcome uh, these problems and they are problems uh, uh, without getting rid of all livestock that are <coughs> that, that, that uh, I'm going to move on. <laughs> uh, organic farming it's <coughs> the manure is a relatively minor part of organic farming uh, of, of mixed organic farming it basically depends on green manures. Uh, uh, and uh, a rotation of crops um, and, uh, 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 and uh, furthermore, cover crops are the uh, a recommended way of ensuring that uh, the nitrogen and other, uh, uh, other nutrients are reabsorbed. Uh, <clears throat> there are losses, indeed, the, the sort of losses are in any system. Um, the uh, On the matter of um, the biodiversity, uh, the uh, well, I quote the, the Natural History Museum, for example. Uh, sorry, the uh, plant, plant life. Hundreds of different wildflowers and fungi have evolved, co-evolved over millennia, with farmers managing their land as hay and meadows and pasture. The first state of nature report: arable plants are considered the fastest declining group of plants in the UK. A quarter are threatened, and others, such as downy hemp nettle, have already been lost from, from the UK. <clears throat> the the uh, conservationists that I talk to are most concerned with what is happening to farming. The State of Nature report, which uh, 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 catalogues the decline in species in this country, uh, <clears throat> refers back to a decline that has taken place since 1970. Well, in 1970, we were farming more land than we are now. Farming is not the problem for the loss of, uh, of, of, of the, these species. It's certainly uh, a, a problem in where there is encroachment into wild areas, and that, that needs to be stopped. And there are certain, uh, there's certainly a need to reduce the amount of uh, meat in particular uh, that we are consuming, but that doesn't mean we have to stop it all. The, uh, uh, th there's also a tendency to uh, uh, equate meat with dairy. And we've got to remember that da dairy, I mean, <clears throat> people like George like to focus on beef because it's reputed to have a, a, a particularly, uh, 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 because it has a, <clears throat> uh, a wide land use and it has uh, a heavy, uh, emission, methane emissions. Uh, I would need a bit longer here to explain why methane emissions from uh, a, a, a herd of cows that is not increasing uh, is uh, not causing any global warming. Uh, the methodology currently used for examining, uh, for comparing uh, uh, methane to uh, carbon dioxide is basically recognized being wrong. It was recognized as wrong when it was first instituted 30 years ago in the 1990s by the I IPCC. It's uh, uh, a, a herd of cows that is static over a period of 40 years is uh, because methane uh, has a uh, uh, a short life in the atmosphere, 
uh, if the herd if the herd of cows is static over uh, over forty years, then as much methane is being lost from the atmosphere as it's putting in. Uh, this is uh, incontestable. It's uncontested. It means that uh, nearly all of the uh, academic papers that are comparing, as George just did, cows with cars, are basically wrong. They, they, and the, all these academics know it's wrong, but they don't readjust their papers. George knows it's wrong, but he doesn't readjust this myth. The, the, and there are other ways why the comparison with cars and, uh, uh, and, and cows is inaccurate. <clears throat> and uh, for, it is really about time. I have tried to, I, <clears throat> I got commissioned to write this by The Guardian um, uh, <clears throat> about this whole issue. I wrote a paper on it. I sent it to the scientists who, who um, uh, uh, well, the Oxford Martin Group, uh, Miles Allen and so forth. I sent it to The Guardian. They refused to print it after commissioning. They have not uh, done in, that was in 2018. They haven't, in, in five, five years, they haven't published a single item in The Guardian uh, explaining why the current methodology for analyzing uh, uh, methane from beef and other animals is inaccurate. It's about time it happened, George. <clears throat> and, uh, and the fact is that in Britain, over the last 40 years, the number of cows has declined by 25%, which suggests that it's highly likely that in fact, we are now having a cooling effect upon the upon the earth. Uh, but I, as for the the studge, the uh, fermented microbial uh, material that uh, um, that George brought up in the end, um, uh, well, that there are there's huge worries about this. Uh, first, it uses vast amounts of, uh, of electricity. Uh, uh, which would need to be created by, uh, well, it needs hydrogen, basically created by uh, uh, electrolysis. At the moment, uh, well, every, the, the problem with this is that every industry uh, from um, steel to concrete to long distance transport wants to use uh, green hydrogen. The amount of green hydrogen currently produced is something somewhere between one four hundredth and one one thousandth of of what we actually need um, if we're, if we're going to decarbonize our energy system. Uh, if this hydrogen is then taken away out of uh, diverted from uh, the energy sector into the food sector, then that will mean that we'll we. A, a larger amount of uh, of CO2 carbon accumulating in the atmosphere. Um, the, well, the two things that we're re that worry me about the the, the, the whole uh, um, uh, microbial studge uh, uh, proposal. Firstly, uh, what are we going to do with the two billion two to three billion peasants <coughs> who currently uh, uh, earn their living from the land uh, um, and whilst emitting vastly uh, smaller amount of, uh, 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 of, of greenhouse gases than we do in, uh, over here. Are, are they all going to be shoved into high rise blocks? Uh, uh, do you envisage a world where everybody is crammed into uh, <coughs> this sort of um, ghetto really, uh, while divorced from nature, looking at nature through a screen, while the, the, the world goes back to some prelapsarian Eden. Um, uh, and, but the other thing that, uh, and the, the other worry about it is, is that it is, uh, uh, George now regards farming as being the biggest threat to life on this planet. Well, no, actually, the biggest threat to life on this planet is fossil fuels. And what 
worries me more than anything else about the vegan agenda is that it is diverting and this is uh, is diverting uh, attention from what is the most urgent need to uh, 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 in terms of saving the planet, which is to stop using fossil fuels, keep the oil in the ground, and uh, and if that happens, then automatically uh, there will be far fewer uh, livestock because we won't be able to maintain it. We won't be able to maintain the the uh, the uh, uh, fer fertilizers to produce all the food uh, to feed them, uh, to feed livestock. One minute, Simon. One minute. Uh, I, I'm not sure I, I've got anything further to say. Uh, the uh, It is vital that we in uh, the North, in the industrial countries, reduce our meat uh, <coughs> consumption, uh, uh, and particularly the factory fed uh, meat, uh, simply as an example to the rest of the world. George is right. We cannot go on consuming more and more and more and more meat. <coughs> uh, we can actually consume quite a lot of dairy because it's far more efficient, but we have to reduce. And, but uh, just because we have to reduce, it does not mean we have to stop because we lose so much of our previous history, of our culture, of our way of life, things that George regards as aesthetic, but actually aesthetics in that sense are important. They are culture, they are human culture, something that has grown up over, uh, over as I say, 12,000 years. And we, we need to preserve that as well as all the wild nature that we treasure. Thank you, Simon. Sure, we have 10 minutes. Thanks very much, Simon. So I'll, I'll try to go through these one by one. Um, first of all, yes, you're absolutely right that um, manure is not the only means of recycling nutrients through an organic system. Um, cover crops, particularly leguminous crops, are also important, but there's no way they can make up for losses on the scale that we're seeing from the leaching of nutrients out of manure. So there is a net loss going on year on year, which is why organic systems in the past have declined and declined and declined, and you know why the need for artificial fertilizers came in in the first place. Um, and you know we we just can't wish that issue away by waving our hands about it. Now, this methane myth, there comes a point where it just approaches straightforward climate change denial promoted by the livestock industry. And, and that, Simon, is what you're currently promoting because current papers, they absolutely take into account the new GWP star um, means of accounting for methane, and they still show. In, in fact, they show that the FAO figures of 14.5% are out of date. It's more like 16, 17, or 18% of global greenhouse gas emissions are produced by livestock using those new methane metrics. So you know, maybe you haven't updated your research since 2018, but there's a, been an awful lot going on since then, and you're not taking that into account. Um, and, and this whole thing has been pushed by the livestock industry to say, here we are, we're carbon negative. Look, we're sucking up emissions. We're not producing them. It's as bad as any of the climate change denial you get from ExxonMobil. Because the thing about methane, it, it's, yeah, absolutely. We need to take into account an accurate, um, uh, we, need, we need an accurate science of the residence time of methane in the atmosphere. And that means that the long-term impacts of methane are lower than were previously assumed. But it also means that the short-term impacts are higher than previously assumed. And what we know with, with action on climate is we have to act now and we have to take the most effective immediate action we possibly can and reducing methane emissions is far quicker than reducing carbon dioxide emissions so that should be our number one aim and the top cause of anthropogenic methane emissions is livestock so if you want to reduce greenhouse gases the first thing you do is to reduce livestock and simon is trading 
in the myths which are being put about by big meat, by JBS, by Tyson, by Cargill, by these big meat trading companies, which are as bad and as deceptive in their propaganda as the, the big oil companies are. And we should not allow ourselves, however convenient for our argument it might be, to go down that road. The next issue, which is similar, we talk about electricity. And it's true that um, microbial fermentation, precision fermentation, um, if we are to adopt this, requires more electricity. My calculations suggest that all things being equal, if we were to replace all protein sources that we currently have with microbial protein, and you know that's unlikely to go that far, all things being equal, we would increase global electricity demand by 11%. But all things are not equal, and here's why. We know that in order to decarbonize our energy supply, we have to first electrify that as well, but simultaneously electrify that supply and replace fossil sources by renewables or indeed by nuclear. But in doing that, we have massively to oversize the system in order to ensure that it's reliable because the wind doesn't always blow and the sun doesn't always shine. And so you need enough surplus capacity in that system so that there's going to be enough electricity produced at any one time to keep the lights on. And that surplus capacity, all those extra wind turbines which are producing electricity when you don't need it, and those extra solar panels which are producing electricity when you don't need it, that is a perfect source of the hydrogen which can feed this system. Now, Simon's quite right that there is currently a lot of competition for hydrogen, and not nearly enough hydrogen to, to supply it, but that's because we don't have nearly enough penetration of renewables on, on our grid. But that's very quickly going to change. And if we are to prioritize the use of, of that hydrogen, well, the stupidest thing you can do with it is to use it as a transport fuel. There's a whole lot of, of technical reasons why that's a really bad idea. Heating fuel, similarly, it's not a great um, substitute for heating fuel. There's a lot of issues with hydrogen there. An industrial process fuel, sure, making steel, making cement and stuff, then it makes sense. And in terms of, of food production, that's probably the biggest gain in the uh, biggest reduction in greenhouse gas emissions that you can get per kilo of hydrogen because of the enormous differential between what's coming out of the end of the system in terms of emissions and the animal products that it's replacing. So I would put, um, even if there were future constraints on hydrogen, which are much less likely than, than they are today, I would still prioritize food production as, as a use of it. Simon talks about, well, what do we do? What do we do with peasants? We don't do anything with peasants. It's not up to us to decide what happens to, to, to small farmers around the world. The great majority of small farmers, I hope, and I would strongly defend them, will continue to be small farmers and will continue to farm. In fact, I suggest various mechanisms for, for strengthening the hand of small farmers against the hand of large ones. Uh, but uh, with bringing in a whole series of new and fascinating techniques, we would hope to expand the opportunity to farm in different ways. Um, and, you know, we're not talking about wiping out farming here. I'm talking about livestock farming. And, uh, and I'm not even talking about removing all livestock from the planet. You know, we're, we're talking about the livestock which um, people in this room might be eating, which, you know, the great majority of which are produced in countries like ours, often with grain brought from miles away, or on what Simon calls default um, livestock production systems, such as, well, Dartmoor is an example, not far from here, an ecological crime scene, a place whose natural vegetation type is temperate rainforest, one of the richest of all our habitats, but has basically been reduced to a millennia wasteland, a wasteland dominated by one coarse grass species by repeated cycles of cutting and burning. Now, that's what I want to see the back of, not a small farmer with one hectare or two hectares, the great majority of whom are not directly engaged in the market economy we're talking about, so are quite unlikely to be directly affected by, 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 by the discussions we're having. And, and frankly, you know, it is not, you know, we're not here to dispose of the lives of other people. You know, and, and I sort of worry about this top-down language. What do we do with the peasants? You know, that is just... You know, I don't think that's how we should be talking about these very complex issues in the 21st century. And 
so Simon comes out on, well, talks about dairy. I mean, dairy is a huge environmental problem. You know, he says, I don't talk about it. I talk about it quite a lot. You know, it's the biggest cause of river pollution in this country. In Devon, it's, it's by far and away the biggest cause of river pollution. We all focus on sewage farms because of the moral force field around farming. But, but the water companies are only the second biggest cause of pollution in this country. Agriculture is the biggest cause and of agriculture, dairy is the biggest cause of that. In fact, I became a vegan because I was on the river Calm in East Devon and it had been turned into a sewer. It was just a stinking sewer. The only thing alive in it was, was sewage fungus. And I traced the cause up to a dairy farm which had built a pipe from the lip of its slurry lagoon into the river. When I contacted the environment agency and they came to look, they said, thanks very much, sir, but it's not a serious case. And I went, what do you mean it's not a serious case? It wiped out miles of this river. And when I wrote that up and said, what does the farmer have to do to get prosecuted, detonate an atom bomb? I had two whistleblowers separately from the environment agency kept, got hold of me and said, we've been instructed from the top. And the top then was Liz Truss as environment secretary, not to enforce against dairy farms. That's why I became vegan. It was that moment. And dairy is an enormous issue. The, the dairy uh, cattle are fed on maize, for, uh, forage maize, which is uh, ripping apart our soils. It's a great soil killing crop. 75% of the maize fields in the Southwest are suffering serious soil degradation. You can see it at this time of year. They're fed on silage and silage is grown in fields which are basically green concrete. They're just harvested again and again, three times, four times, even sometimes five times a year. There's nothing else living in them at all. It's a wasteland. Um, but, you know, unless you've got this tiny, tiny setting where you've got two cows feeding a dozen people or whatever it is at Moncton Wild, you know, if you're producing on any sort of scale, to feed the great majority urban population or population through the current food chain or any conceivable food chain which can reach such large numbers of people, that scale is going to lead to the kind of impacts we're talking about. We could relieve those impacts. And Simon says, well, the aesthetics are important, sure, but we've got different aesthetics. You know, he's got a cultural aesthetic which says, relates to 12,000 years of human history. Well, I would argue that actually what we're seeing in the farm landscape today is, 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 is fundamentally a Neolithic production system, but it doesn't look a lot like it. But anyway, we can put that to one side. I've also got an aesthetic which draws on 4.5 billion years of evolution and the, the absolute heartbreaking horror of seeing the natural world getting ripped apart and going down the toilet in our own lifetimes, in front of our very eyes. The great wonders of the only planet we know that supports life just going, vanishing at extraordinary speed in this sixth great extinction. So if we're talking about aesthetics and if it really comes down to aesthetics, I'm gonna put my aesthetics ahead of Simon's. Thank you. Thank you both. And as Simon said, I just wish we had a lot longer because uh, we could talk for hours and I'd happily listen, but unfortunately we don't have time. But we do have time for questions and comments from the audience. Anna's got a mic. So does anyone in the audience like to say, yes, they, this the person with the glasses. Yep, you, yep. Oh, you want to shout it out? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. No, that's, that's a great question and I, I'm very glad to hear it. So um, agroecology, I think, is the answer. You know, we, we're going to, we obviously need to continue to grow grains. We need to continue to grow vegetables, in fact, far more fruit and vegetables than we're eating at the moment. We, most people eat far too few. And we need ways of producing that crucial food, which doesn't destroy the soil and destroy all the other resources that, that we're talking about. And a great deal of that comes down to our highly limited understanding of the soil. You know, we, we, soil is almost a black box. There was a paper published in 2020 saying, we think we might know what soil is. I've subsequently spoken to the authors of that paper and said, we're revising our opinion. We actually don't know what soil is. <laughs> um, 
it's a it's it's an extraordinary bizarre ecosystem but you know we scarcely any idea of what's going on there and the extremely intricate relations between plants bacteria fungi and other soil organisms now i believe and drawing particularly on the work of people like ian tolhurst this uh, tolly this amazing uh, veganic grower in in oxfordshire who's who's managed to tweak soil ecology. And he's done so really by recognizing that our, what we call agricultural soils are basically woodland soils. And he's been mimicking how woodland soils behave and, and looking at the sort of litter fall of some very small amounts of, of wood landing on that soil over the course of the year in a woodland and, and how that, that builds and preserves the soil. And so he's been trying to mimic that with extraordinary results. You know, he's. He's without any fertilizer or any manure, he's managed to hit the lower bound of conventional yields on much better soil than his. And that is a model, which one of many potential models which could be rolled out. But unfortunately, we've no idea why it works on his farm and on several other farms which have successfully adopted it, but why it doesn't work on other farms. Some people can make it work, some people can't. It's something to do with the soil. We don't know what it is. So. I'm currently investing my time in what I think is a very exciting soil project. Um, we've stumbled across this extraordinary new means, I think, I hope, of characterizing soil very cheaply. Um, myself and a team at Oxford and Harper Adams Universities, uh, we did proof of concept trials at Harper Adams in November and got remarkable results. And, and and now my, my task this year is to raise the money to, to try to expand that and turn it eventually into a global program. And what we're hoping is that if we can, we can look into the soil effectively in real time and get a much better idea of issues like um, soil moisture, compaction, connected porosity, um, organic material um, so, uh, or soil carbon, nutrient profiles and the rest, then we can aim for that holy grail of agroecology, which is high yields with low impacts. So I'm trying not just to talk about it, I'm trying to find a, a means of implementing it. And my belief is that the, the key is a much better understanding of the soil. Could I just yeah, yeah. come in on that? Uh, uh, that um, yeah, I would agree. Uh, but uh, it's uh, none of that is incompatible with uh, uh, with keeping livestock, uh, Tolly's system is is basically lay farming. Um, he has introduced uh, the, 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 the introduced um, uh, shred wood, uh, wood chip and so forth. Uh, but he 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 fertilizes it his land in exactly the same way as uh, livestock mixed livestock farmers do, which is 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 through green manures. Uh, the only difference is the green manures are given, uh, go through uh, a, a cow or uh, some other animal first uh, before finding their way back to the land. And um, uh, that, uh, so you get more animal protein for somewhat less fertilizing ability. Uh, but, you know, Tolly's system is, is not incompatible with livestock whatsoever. Uh, nor are the sort of uh, regenerative agriculture and and uh, and, and examination of, uh, of uh, analysis of soil and so forth that we talk about. All that can happen with agri uh, with, with livestock as well. I don't see the need for abolishing them. Well, well, the figures Tolly produces and that I give in the book um, show that really it, it can't possibly work with livestock because of the much greater land requirement. You you would be produce you need far more land to produce far fewer vegetables, but also you would completely throw out the um, greenhouse gas balance that he's managed to achieve, uh, and he's among the very few to do it. Something close to carbon neutrality, uh, livestock would completely destroy that. Thank you. Yes, in the front there. <laughs> Um, my name is Jyoti Fernandez. Um, I work for and with um, La Via Campesina. Um, La Via Campesina is an organization representing 200 million peasant farmers across the world. Um, and we ask the question, you know, what are you proposing happens with the peasants? Um, because we are, you know, representing peasants. We will work alongside the um, pastoralists and the indigenous peoples organizations in the world representing the huge numbers 
millions and millions of people who live in more symbiotic relationships between the food production systems, natural systems, and livestock and animals, whether it's hunting and gathering wild animals or working with um, you know, animals within a system. It might be chickens eating the scrap food or the pigs eating you know, the waste products or cows that are fed on, on waste fodder and co-products and byproducts of their own agroecological systems, right? And um, I think <clears throat> what's really important to point out is that when we say what happens to the peasants is that the narrative you're promoting is very powerful. And that narrative can really drive people out of their livelihoods. So it's not just what happens to the peasants, it's about what is the narratives that's actually impacting the livelihoods and the sorts of systems that can be those high yielding agroecological systems that you promote. I've looked through your book many, many times and I've seen that you're not anti-agroecology, but I've never seen in there any distinction between the industrial livestock system, which I 100% agree with you and everyone in Livia Campesina and the indigenous people losing land across the world to the huge ranches that are taking up their territories would totally agree that that is destructive of the planet. It's driving the climate chaos that's destroying their livelihoods and their basis of, of production and their connections to cultures that are fun fundamentally intricate and connected to nature. They would agree that, that in those industrial farming systems are bad, but we see no, where in your narrative, a distinction between the sort of livestock systems that are compatible with indigenous high yielding agroecological farming systems or, or, or systems that can be developed with livestock as a small part of that. And, and that lack of a distinction is inc incredibly dangerous really because it drives a narrative that actually drives people from those livelihoods. And my question is when you're talking about Bennett's law, which is that as people move into the monetary economy, move into the consumption lifestyles that really are by, based on buying products all the time, how does that fit into this narrative of actually saying that all livestock systems are bad or agroecological systems that might have livestock or animals as a part of them are bad? Because say in India, for example, there's 95 million small scale dairy producers, most of them with two to four cows, You know, uh, 75 million of those are women who will go around with cows and use the default outputs of other arable livestock systems, very, very sustainable, high yielding agroecological systems to generate food for their communities, for their families, you know, so uh, like food security, very high nutritional food security for those communities. If they get driven out of that livestock because of a narrative that's happening on an international level that all livestock farming is bad, and that does happen with development programs. I've sat in the FAO, I've watched these debates happen. I've seen the narrative being taken over with corporate capture of a of, of, of false narrative. You know, it might be a vision you know, that, um, you know, this bucolic vision that a peasant farming, these small ones extrapolated big is a romantic fantasy. But I think it's no, it's not a romantic fantasy to the scale that a corporate produced food could actually feed the world in a more sustainable way and hold us in harmony with the kind of planet that we need moving to the future. I don't think it's any more of a fantasy than that. And you have millions of people around the world living this lifestyle and it's their lifestyle is not a fantasy. And when it gets painted as a fantasy, that what's, that's what happens to drive people off the land and it, it feeds Bennett's law, which means that people move into that consumptive lifestyle. It means people start moving into the monetary economy, which might be considered richer, but actually consume a lot more, or they get driven into dire, dire poverty. And, and I think, you know, looking back at those narratives and making that distinction is incredibly important. And I'd really like for you to make that distinction. Industrial livestock, corporate controlled livestock, these huge landowners taking huge amounts of land and being incredibly greedy is not good. But peasant farming, where livestock is a part of it, is good. And that distinction is incredibly important to make. Thanks, Jyoti. Well, first, I think you credit me with too much power. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, but, um, you know, thank you for, for those points. So the first thing to say is that all my writing is aimed at the people who read the book, who are basically people in the um, market economy, people like ourselves, people who buy our food. Um, it's, you know, and there's nothing in the book which says that the people you're talking about should be driven off the land, should be driven out of their livelihoods. Far from it. I talk specifically about the horror of land grabbing, the enormous corporate concentration, which is a real thing that's driving people out. It's not me. I'm not destroying peasants. It's this massive corporate concentration by people like Tyson, by JBS, by Cargill, who are able to produce far more cheaply the same products 
that, that, that peasant farmers might be producing, and they undercut their markets. And sure, it is a whole global capitalist system as well, but that's not me either. I'm not driving that. I'm not causing that. I'm pointing to very real existential problems, as real as the fossil fuel industry, as real as the greenhouse gases driving us past temperature limits. I'm looking at livestock driving us past ecological limits on a planetary scale. And the vast majority of those livestock products are being consumed by wealthy people and by people in the market economy. I, you know, if, if I am not focusing on the people that you're talking about, that's because I'm not seeing them as the problem. I'm focusing on the problem and trying to solve the problem. And in doing so, I do no disservice at all to the people that you're discussing. You have shifted blame. No offset, Jyoti. You have shifted blame. You have shifted blame off the capitalist system. You have shifted blame off the big corporations onto someone who is challenging that system, onto someone who is trying to address one of the greatest threats, possibly the greatest threat to life on earth. And as I say repeatedly in the book, I'm in favor of an agroecological system. I'm in favor of a system that favors small farmers. But you know, right across the board, we have to be able to survive. And small farmers are now facing a huge new threat, which is environmental collapse. In fact, the, the, the zones of habitable parts of the world are moving at extraordinary speed. One estimate suggests that, uh, what is it, 1.5 billion people are soon going to be living in parts of the world where the average temperature is 29 degrees. In other words, the middle of the Sahara, those temperatures. And that makes farming impossible. Unless we deal with these huge existential issues I'm talking about, the collapse of earth systems, there will be no peasant farming whatsoever because those earth systems will die. There will be no water. There will be no habitable land for the peasants to live on. We're on the same side here. But, be, but you know, if you start pointing the finger of blame at me for trying to solve these huge problems, that drives us apart and it's pointless. It's a sort of infighting which, which leads to movements disintegrating rather than to cohering. What we need to be doing is addressing the diets which predominate in societies like, like our own is seeing how those diets can radically change, not just to create a better world for non-human life, which we urgently need to do, but also to create a better world for all human life. Okay, any, any more questions or comments? Someone in the back. I can't see you, but maybe right in the back. Yeah. I have a question for George, mainly. I think um, a lot of people in this room will probably agree that our I guess, concern around nature and our consumption choices, our political decisions that we make, come from a connection to nature, our love for nature, like we care about it and so we want to act to protect it. Are you not concerned that um, taking a lot of our food consumption into a laboratory and making it technological sort of is going to cause a disconnect between people, especially people in cities who aren't like us and don't have a connection with nature. Thank you. Yeah. Well, that's another excellent question. Um, and this relates to something that Simon said about how we're going to be um, re removed from the land. I, I don't understand this at all. I mean, if we look, for instance, even at the rural population of the UK, only 3% of the rural population, sorry, of England, 3% of the rural population of England are farmers. 97% are not farmers. 0.3%, this is with the maximal definition of what a farmer is. 0.3% of the population, of the total population of England are farmers. And farmers can say, I've got this strong connection to the land. Frankly, some of them express that connection by absolutely trashing their land. Some of them are, are very you know, responsible and some of them, they, they don't love their land. They, you'd think they would hate their land. The, the, the way they treat it. And I often visit those farms and think, I love this land more than you do. You know? And the rest of us, you know, we are shut out of 92% of the surface area of England, almost exclusively by farming. You know, because it's being farmed, we can't walk there. And even in places where we can, because of the damage done by farming, there's much less to engage with. This is what we see on Dartmoor. 
you know, instead of these incredibly rich ecosystems, which would be there, these millennia wastes, which you can scarcely walk through at all because of these massive tussocky grass, which are the result of hammering and hammering and hammering that land until it, it's a dead zone. I mean, it looks like the surface of the moon. It's just horrible. And so there's much less to engage with. And for me, rewilding has always been about rewilding us as well as rewilding the living world. It's been about greatly enhancing our connection to the living world. And it's about all of us having that rich connection to the living world, rather than a few people who say, well, I own this land, so that's my connection. That is an, a great privilege to own that land. And it's a privilege which is often abused, as I say, but it's not a privilege that we can all share. Whereas rich, wild ecosystems with the right to roam, that is a privilege or a right, rather, a freedom that we can all share. And that freedom gets greatly enhanced by rewilding the land. If you rewild the bit of land that I work on, what happens is that uh, bracken and brambles invade very, very quickly. It becomes, in fact, impassable. Uh, I was when I first came there, I was told to make a wild wildlife walk around the place. Well, the wildlife walk could. Uh, would, would, uh, soon became absolutely impassable and had to become a managed walk. And in fact, where most people walk is out in the open on the grass where they can actually get through. An awful lot of wild wood and wild land is frankly impassable. So bracken and brambles obviously are the early stages of succession. Uh, you know, and again, we constantly hear livestock farmers, oh, you want it all to go to bracken and brambles. Well, for start, bracken and brambles grow where woodland previously grew. That's a very good sign of a woodland soil. But that's the early stages. That's how it starts. And these early successional stages, we demonize them. Scrub. Oh, we don't want scrub. Scrub is terrible. Scrub means regenerating woodland. We should welcome it. But instead, whenever we see nature beginning to come back, like on Dartmoor, we go and torch it. They call it swaling on Dartmoor. And even the National Park sort of endorses it and says it's a wonderful cultural tradition. It's burning the land. Whenever the nature starts to come back, when it's trying to be what it wants to be, which is temperate rainforest. And Guy Shrovsoul here in Dartington has, has written a magnificent book, The Lost Rainforest of, of Britain. We go and torch it to return it to this the plagioclimax of, of, of grass species. It's such a miserablest approach to nature. Well, one can have both. Uh, and uh, if you eliminate the animals, you will eliminate a whole range of ecosystems that have, uh, have developed over years and years and years. Nobody's saying we should get rid of the of woodland, nearly everybody here would like want to see more trees in the correct place. But we can have both. And if you have both, then you have more biodiversity. If you eliminate all the biodiversity in this country that relates to farming, you will have less biodiversity. Well, you can create intermediate disturbance regimes, as ecologists call them, um, with the help of, of livestock, of herbivores. But we're talking tiny, tiny numbers. So if you look at net for example, the Net Wildland Estate in Sussex, which uh, is a very famous rewilding area, they, they use cattle and pigs, but in really, really small numbers. So they produce on average 56 kilograms per hectare per year. And if we were to roll that out across the country, we'd each have 75 kilo, uh, calories of meat a day and nothing else. You know, we're talking about really tiny amounts of, of, of meat. So we shouldn't confuse conservation grazing in a few places. And I can see a role for that with livestock production. These are completely different systems. In the uplands, it's even more stark. Um, to, to get any trees to grow at all, you need to reduce your sheep to about one ev uh, every um, 20 hectares, no more than that. So you know, it's such a tiny amount of sheep, you might as well not have any at all. But you, these are not production systems. They, an intermediate disturbance regime is completely different to actually trying to produce any appreciable quantities of meat or milk. Thank you. We've got 10 minutes, so if I want to get as many questions as we can, so we keep them brief and answers to the point. Lady with the black t shirt there.
Well, so for a start, you're right, there is no inherent conflict between the solutions I'm promoting and agroecology. In fact, far from it, without these solutions, there will be no agroecology for the reasons we're talking about. I mean, we, we're going to see ecological collapse making it impossible. Um, and I want to preserve it, I want to enhance it, I want to see far more of it and far less of, of the kind of damaging unsustainable farming that, that we, we see in countries like our own and indeed in, in, in many parts of the world, most parts of the world. And you say we shouldn't talk about extremes. These are extreme. This situation is about as extreme as it could possibly be. But we keep going back to this idea of separating humans from the land. I'm talking about exactly the opposite. I'm talking about a massive re-engagement of humans with the land. I completely agree. No, no. Absolutely, it is. Absolutely, but it shouldn't be the only means of engagement with the land we have, and it shouldn't be a privilege for just a very small number of people. Well, none of us want to live a small, small number of people. Could we live there just to get some more questions out? Yeah. Just up at the back there. I oh, know, sorry. Sorry, it's me. <laughs> um, so I was just wondering, I guess, on some of the points that Sasha just mentioned, and I think both of you have spoken around it a little bit um, throughout the whole evening, but um, on this kind of well, divorce or separation of humanity from nature, um, I just wondered if, I know you just mentioned, George, particularly that um, you were talking about a, a huge re-engagement with nature, and you've spoken a little bit about sort of the land system that we have currently. Do you see that there's something somewhat worrying about places like the Nepa state, for example, which, although has seen massive boon in biodiversity and biodiversity increase and in re not reintroduction, but re, yeah, large numbers of biodiversity increasing and certain species, the population increasing. But do you know, that to me feels a little bit like it's effectively the people that already own the land, yeah. the aristocracy, for yeah. example, who can have these rewilding vanity projects essentially put a fence around the wild mm -hmm. in inverted commas and charge people a premium to yeah. go and look at it yeah. it's not something that is accessible for all it's no, it's rewild and it's the wild yeah. for the benefit of landowners and the rich and i guess that's the whole definition i guess of rewilding in my mind doesn't yeah. yet necessarily seem very clear in in the discourse the wider discourse mm -hmm. because it, it has that deeply colonial aspect of seeing humans as not part of nature and I think and not part of the wild and I think that's something that we need to speak about okay, and I just well, wonder if you can yeah, comment yeah so, on that. so I've often railed against what I call the aristocratic rewilding model um, it's not the way I want things to go um, I'm much more interested for instance in the Langham Moor community buyout in in southern Scotland where local people have got together bought up a grouse moor which they are rewilding as part of their community buyout and as part of their community re-engagement with the land i you know for many many years in fact simon and i were among the co-founders of the land is ours to try to democratize our engagement with the land and this is a crucial part of the way i want to see rewilding going um, so, you know, I'm, 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 and, you know, while community buyout is the ideal, you can't do that in England, but, you know, there are other models. So the Trees for Life type model, the uh, Borders Forest Trust model, where you can crowdfunded land purchases is another approach. In places like Dartmoor, you know, I want to see a mass democratization of the decision making on that land. There's a, a friend of mine, um, uh, the recent, a new friend of mine, um, um, says, you know, it, it, this crazy situation there where the commons have become the enclosures and the enclosures have become the commons, you know, a tiny handful of people, most of whom don't actually live there, own all the common rights, um, extract a huge amount of money from Dartmoor, which they, they, they don't reinvest in Dartmoor at all. They, 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 they suck it out of the system and prevent anything from changing. Whereas, you know, what we've seen recently is a massive public appetite 
for engaging in, in the question of how land and Dartmoor should be managed, but there's no democratic outlet for that. We also have a situation where, you know, we're paying in, in the UK three billion pounds a year in, in farm subsidies, largely to the richest people, the biggest landowners, people like James Dyson, these massive harvesters, vacuumers of subsidies. I was going to say he's hoovering them up, but that would actually be, um, and um, <laughs> that would be a trademark issue. But, but the, um, and, 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 and we have absolutely no say on, you know, I know the government's trying to change the subsidy system, but it's been a completely closed conversation basically between government, the farmers, one or two other bodies. It's taxation without representation. Everything about our land use is undemocratic. And it's not just rewilding we need to democratize. It's a whole decision-making process. It's, it's a whole access process. It's everything about the relationship between human beings and, and land, which is one of the most fundamental relationships of all. And it's in the hands of a tiny number of people who don't let us in physically or politically. And that needs to change. And where's Anna? Have we got time for one more question? Yes, we have one from over here. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Can't answer any questions. Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, my name's John Crisp. Um, I farm about 20 minutes away from here. Um, I'm a livestock farmer. Um, and I, I'm just a bit quite angry that I'm kind of being lumped into this same category as, um, you know, all this, all these, I mean, essentially what George has been describing is just a series of bad practices in, in farming. And they've only grown um, because of fossil fuels for no other reason. And fossil fuels obviously are gonna have to be phased out and farming is gonna have to change. I mean, even your example about um, nitrogen losses um, from organic, you know, putting organic manure on, on the soil. Um, no farmer wants to do that because you're losing your nutrients. It's madness. You know, so of course, yes, if you're yeah. a good farmer, you will avoid that at all costs. You know, it's ridiculous to assume that all organic farmers are gonna be, gonna be practicing this sort of thing. But that's kind of how you come across. And I think that's why it's very frustrating to hear a lot of what you've got to say. Um, the reason nitrogen is lost is, is because you, A, way too much is put on um, and they, it's plowed in. And in an anaerobic environment, um, it, it's, 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 um, it's released as nitrogen oxide or as nitrate and then it's leached into the soil or it goes up into the, into the atmosphere. Um, but there's an easy way around that. And, you know, organic farming is not perfect. Of course, we need farming, organic farming needs to change. But all you have to do is compost it first. It's very simple. It's something we've been doing for hundreds of years. And it's the organic pioneers were uh, talked about nothing, nothing but compost. Unfortunately, the organic movement, the way it progressed, forgot about a lot of this stuff. Um, the other thing I'd really like to say is, <clears throat> you know, we're a livestock farm. We audit, we do, we do a carbon audit. So we've been, we've been doing this since, since 2010. And we are a net sequester. We, we sequester carbon to the tune of 2.93 tons carbon dioxide per hectare per year ongoing. Um, so, to, you know, I, your quote about, um, I don't know what you say, um, beans being transported, I don't know, thousands of times around the planet, um, and it still produces less emissions than, than, than you know, meat or, or milk or whatever it is. I mean, it's absolute nonsense. You know, if you, you what you're talking about is really bad practices that need to be phased out. We need to talk about best practice, you know, and that's what we need to move towards. And people like you ought to be trying to promote best practice, trying to promote things like pasture-fed livestock, where we the pasture, the PFLA, pasture-fed, um, pasture for life, 
is, is uh, another certification on top of organic, um, which we are a member of, um, where we're not allowed to feed any byproducts, we're not allowed to feed any grain, soya, anything like that. You know, so deforestation in, in, in the Amazon, it has nothing to do with us. We're pasture fed, we're pasture alive. You know, so there are ways that people can go out and buy these products and be sure about um, that they're not contributing to, to damage to the environment. In fact, when they buy a product, you know, lamb from our farm, essentially we can claim that we are sequestering X amount, X kilos of, of uh, carbon dioxide into the soil per kilo of product, <laughs> you know. So we're reversing climate change and that's the way we need to go. And, um, you know, um, essentially, it's essentially what, what I, I think Simon um, talked about lay farming. And I think it's worth asking the question, why did lay farming, you know, why did it, be, why was it phased out? I mean, obviously they're, they still exist. Most organic farms are, will be mixed farms. Um, but why, why this specialization? The specialization is essentially just because just because of fossil fuels, because you can just chuck um, artificial fertilizers on the land. You know, again, everything comes down to, to fossil fuels in the end. And the, the, one of the problems... Can you draw it to an end, please? Sorry? Can you draw your point to an end, please? Okay, just the last point is, you know, uh, arable farming is actually an extractive process that produces a lot of carbon emissions because it, you lose organic matter. The reason for lay farming, the reason for grass, the great thing about grass is not the beef and the milk that you get from it, it's the ability to build back that organic matter into the soil. And that's how the whole cycle works. If you get rid of the grassland, you get rid of organic farming. You, you have to use chemicals. It's the only, it's the only way. So um, that's my final point. Thank you. Now, if you keep it very, very I mean, that, you know, I'm, I'm not blaming you. You know, I can quite understand why you feel hurt by the things I'm saying, but what I'm trying to convey is the science. And, you know, it's, of course, everyone wants to believe that what they're doing is the right thing to do. And we see all sorts of mental gymnastics deployed to try to create that impression. If we start with this issue of artificial nitrogen, yeah, you know, I totally accept the problem of it. And of course, it's currently being produced by fossil fuels. I mean, we can see an electrification of systems which can change things to some extent. But 50% of people on Earth would not be alive if it weren't for that artificial nitrogen. You know, we can create these beautiful bucolic visions of how things ought to be, but we have 8 billion people on this planet and they have to be fed. It's not a luxury. It's not an option. Do we decide to let 4 billion people starve to death? You know, we can't call ourselves humanitarians. We can't even really call ourselves humans if we are prepared to contemplate that outcome. And you take the artificial nitrogen out of the system, that is what happens. Now, you know, I recognize completely that nitrogen and phosphate are, have exceeded the planetary boundaries more than any other input. And the way that we're using them is absolutely shocking. But if you are seriously suggesting we get rid of them, you are talking about getting rid of half the population of the planet. And if also you're suggesting proposing your system as the means by which people are going to be fed, you're talking about getting rid of all ecosystems as well. There was a study conducted in the United States which said, let's assume we do what the food is and the pasture for life people, the pasture fed meat people are telling us we should do and replace grain-fed meat with pasture-fed meat. The outcome would be that the area required for cattle farming in the United States would increase by 270%. The entire land area of the US would have to be turned into cattle farming. And even that, even when you destroyed all the cities, cut down all the forests, drained all the wetlands, watered all the deserts, degazetted all the national parks, you'd still be importing a load of your beef from Brazil. This myth that's been put about that we can all eat pasture fed beef is just that. It's a story, a fairy tale, which does bears no relation to reality. And this is our fundamental, this is our fundamental problem, that we are food innumerate. We don't look at the numbers, we look at the pictures, we look at the stories, but we're not looking at the numbers, we're not looking at the maths of the situation. 
Now, the reason some people can eat pasture-fed meat is that other people don't. If pasture-fed meat was the only meat we produced, it would be super expensive and only millionaires would eat it. You know, we talk about, oh, well, we could eat, all eat a little bit around the year. Is it, can you think of any luxury product where that's the case? Do we all eat a little bit of beluga caviar? Do we all eat a little bit of bluefin tuna? No, that's absolutely not how it works. If you've got a luxury product, it becomes highly concentrated in the hands of the richest people. That's how it would work. We're not talking about any means here of being able to feed the planet. And actually, some people, I think, are talking about starving the planet. You know, we have to be responsible here. There are two things we have to do. We have to feed the world without devouring the planet. And those things are equally important. And if we pursue one while neglecting the other, we're not going to solve any problems at all. And if we pursue neither, as sadly I think some people are doing, because instead they're pursuing this bucolic imagery while being ignorant of the numbers, then we're going to cause a disaster on an unfathomable scale. Uh, well, yes, uh, <clears throat> obviously pasture-fed meat can't provide all the meat that people eat or want to eat at the moment. But don't forget that one quarter of all animal feed, it comes from crop residues, processing waste, and so forth. On top of that, there's the food waste. Uh, <clears throat> That probably about a third of all existing uh, uh, meat uh, comes from those sort of sources, and that will still exist. Uh, what, what, 13, only 13 percent of uh, uh, livestock is uh, 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 all the meat and livestock produced comes from uh, 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 grains. All the rest is either pasture or um, uh, byproducts and co-products. That's that's one thing. Secondly, uh, the the yields in uh, developing countries are, 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 are we have extremely high yields in in Western Europe. Uh, <clears throat> they're much lower in, in 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 developing countries and indeed most of the world and in the United States and in Ukraine. Our our, our yields are twice as high in in, in here in Ukraine. <clears throat> The gap between organic and uh, 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 and uh, chemical agriculture in the rest of the world is much smaller than it is here, simply because our yields are so are so high. Uh, now that uh, fossil fuel fertilizer is getting rather exp expensive, uh, various research organisations are looking into organic agriculture. Uh, but but because they simply had to. There's a, a firm called AgroVista uh, who recently uh, uh, got a yield of nine pound, no, sorry, nine tons of oats per hectare, which is huge, uh, plus half a ton or so of beans by growing the two together. That's where the research needs to be. Oh, and, uh, and that does not exclude livestock. It may reduce the amount of snow, so in fact, it has to reduce the amount of livestock. Finally, I'd like to come to what the gentleman said there, which is that the source of the problem is oil. Yes, the source of the problem is oil uh, and gas. And the most urgent problem that we face at the moment is, <clears throat> is not the problems that you talk about biodiversity. They are a problem, but the most urgent problem, and the one which threatens biodiversity more than anything else, is global warming, right? And <clears throat> the way to stop global warming is not to attack the sheep on the hills and the cows in the fields when there's just masses and masses of vehicles and planes and, and building and God knows what going on. The way to attack it is to stop get, using fossil fuels. And the whole methane thing is a diversion because fossil fuels produce as much methane in their extraction as uh, as cows do uh, or allegedly do because nobody actually knows how much uh, methane they know how much methane cows emit in a if, if you put them in a, a shed and measure it they don't know how much they produce out in the wild because they're all the methanotropes the thing uh, the, the <coughs> microbes that digest uh, methane and nobody actually quite knows what the net production is 
But what they do know is that huge clouds of methane are being emitted by the fossil fuel industry, as much as is, is uh, emitted by cows. But you mentioned methane to any of the public, and they immediately think, cow, why? Because people like you go on and on and on about animals, and they are a diversion from the main issue, which is just stop oil. Okay, so would you, to return to the question, would you eliminate all nitrate fertilizer, all artificial nitrates? Uh, I, I wouldn't uh, 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 eliminate them immediately, but I will put the focus on to uh, organic farming. Uh, <laughs> And the way I would do it is by uh, changing the whole system from one of certification, which puts the burden of uh, certification and of monitoring and of labeling on the organic producers. I would <coughs> get rid of the idea that chemical agriculture is, is conventional. And I would <coughs> and, and instead, put the burden of all the costs of, of, of licensing and labeling on the chemical farmers. And so I would have- I'm not the soil, answering my question. Uh, yes, sir. So I would get the Soil Association to uh, take on the job of licensing the people who are farming badly rather than uh, certifying them with good. The, the way to do this is by a little, I have it here. Uh, the little black tractor, which it, uh, is what the Soil Association would put on the produce of anybody using artificial fertilizers or pesticides. Okay. Uh, that's, and, and that way, industry, <clears throat> people would, auto, would, would prefer to go for organic. Industry would look increasingly at ways of uh, well, put their research into organic. Uh, breeding and so forth, mm. rather than into chemical breeding. Okay, but given and, that and, you blame, and, mm? given that you blame the current system on fossil fuels, yes. and and part of that is the artificial nitrogen produced by fossil yes. fuels, would do you want to eliminate all artificial nitrogen? Eventually, yes, but not, not immediately. And, I, and, I, I am answering your question because I'm mm. saying it, it it can't be done immediately, but it it, it <clears throat> but we need to. <clears throat> uh, uh, Basically, we, we need to stop fossil fuels and the methane that they produce. One of the possible uh, alternatives, of course, to uh, the uh, uh, to nit nitrogen fertilizers that you're talking about is to actually feed your studge to livestock. And <coughs> uh, well, well, this is what it was originally invented for. The, the people who invented it didn't. <coughs> they, they were they thought they were going to sell it for feed. If you what, what happens at the moment? But, uh, the, can, can we bring it yeah. to a close? Okay. <laughs> if you could produce something cheaper than uh, soya, then uh, what happens to soya? Well, a lot of it gets fed to livestock. If you produce a protein that's even cheaper uh, and have enough energy to do it, then by all means, if people eat it, that's great. But you may also find that they feed it to livestock and that will increase the numbers of livestock that poor peasants in hot countries where they can more easily produce this stuff, uh, increase the fertility of their holding. So you're suggesting precision fermentation as a way of maintaining peasant farming. Okay, that's oh, innovative. It, 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 <laughs> it's possible. Yeah, I wonder what Jody would say about that. Anyway, thank you. Thank you so much both. Mm -hmm. Round of applause, please, everyone. Yeah.